Remember this lesson? So many of you asked how to turn all of this fun into a composition. So let's grab an HB pencil, half inch dagger, my whole line paints, gotta spray them down, and Academy watercolor paper. And let's take all of these elements and turn them into a composition. Now, I am starting rough and light by design, making circles where I want my focal point to be. That first circle I made, that's going to be my rosy peony. The second circle is gonna be my zinnia, and these curved lines are representing where I'm envisioning some leaves. Now I'm getting right into it with some super loose suggestion of berries. Today we're talking about composition, friends, so we are literally mapping out very lightly with basic shapes what this overall composition is gonna look like. I am working on a 12 by 12 inch block of watercolor paper to give you some reference. If you haven't watched this video yet to learn how to create all of these individual flowers, watch this first and then come on back. It's so important early in your composition not to get lost in the details. The minutia at this point are going to slow you down. So basic lines, basic shapes, and keep your eye moving around the page as you work to decide whether or not you have a suggested focal point or if you have a good sense of movement. So that's why I'm sketching in these really soft light lines because if I want to make a change at this point I can with an eraser. Starting at the center of my focal peony rose and I'm making these sweeping strokes that start to look like cartoon smiles and I'm overlapping them. They're kind of like imagine clasping your hands together where your fingers kind of go together inside one another. It's a great way to think about how rose petals intertwine. I've also definitely decided that this rose is my focal point. So I'm adding some extra petals here on the outer edge. They're thinner cartoon smiles, but they are there just the same, a few little wiggles and exaggerations because I noticed that my focal point flower was almost the same size as the flower directly to its lower left, and I didn't want that. As I am more confident in the placement within my composition of each flower, I start to press down a little bit harder to give a little more dimension and interest to my sketches. Adding in some leaves here, very simply, and the leaves kind of are hugging along the edge of this rose, going right up to these flower buds. And I am literally sketching right on top of my super duper light basic shapes. And I am not even gonna erase any of this, friends. I am not. But again, I digress. This is about composition. So a few things that I think about when I'm creating a composition. Number one, movement. I want the eye, I want the viewer's eye to constantly be moving around once they've seen the focal point. So the focal point needs to be pretty obvious. And for me, that's usually a sense of scale. That focal point needs to be a little bit larger and in my opinion, a little bit off center. The last thing you wanna do is put your big, beautiful pink rose or peony right smack dab in the middle. And by the end of your composition, you're just gonna feel like you have a big pinwheel with a, a bullseye in the center, trust me. So a little off center, a little larger. Then I like to think about smaller elements that are kind of just a step down in size. So not super tiny yet. So I guess you could say you have a primary focal point and the secondary focal point and then a tertiary focal point yet. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So for me, I think this upper left section is going to be my secondary focal point. It's a collection of different images, but they kind of unify together in this beautiful like upward sweeping motion. So moving on to kind of my third focal point, which is going to be the zinnia flower. And remember friends, if you haven't watched this video, it's the second time I'm mentioning it here, but it's so important because without watching this video first, this one might seem a little off, like you're missing something. So check it out. The second thing you wanna think about with your compositions as you're developing them is angles. So my peony rose was definitely from like a three quarter view. It wasn't straight top down and it wasn't a side view, somewhere in between, right? So my zinnia here, I'm doing this from a full on face down, top down, whatever you wanna call it. So that variety, that interest, that that mixing it up in this <laughs> is what's going to add to the interest and the personality of my composition. Next up, you wanna think about negative space. So what's negative space? 
very simply. It's the spaces of your painting where nothing is being drawn, nothing's going on, nothing's being painted on, right? The leftover. So just as much as you wanna think about the placement and the scale of the elements that you're actually drawing on the page, you also wanna think about the placement and the scale of the leftover spaces. Now, I'm just gonna leave you with that one. That's a whole lot to process, but it's really worth starting to think about at this point in your journey. Okay, I am working on this hydrangea here and I want to talk about how I am overlapping and tucking things in next to one another. So the peony rose is my focal point. I am tucking everything else either behind it or as if it's coming out from it at the same level, the same height. So the spray that curves up and to the left, that spray, I kind of envision that being kind of equal level or height with the peony rose. But the zinnia to the left and the hydrangea now to the upper right, those are tucked behind. So basically you just wanna think about what part of those flowers would not be visible? What part of those flowers is being eclipsed by the peony rose? Because it is front and center. So don't overthink this part, but it is something you do want to kind of hash out in your brain as you're working. And if you take a break from your sketch at this point and you're like, wait, something's not right and it just feels weird, it might be because you don't have the overlapping quite right. And it's usually a very simple fix, a little bit of eraser action, you're all good. The other thing I want you to remember about compositions, my next point is sometimes your decisions don't have to be super formal and don't have to be thoroughly thought through for them to be valuable. So for example, this spray that is curving down to the left corner and then sweeping upwards, I just kind of like that effect that I got with the same element at the top left. So I'm doing it again down here and I'm seeing if it works. And I kind of feel like it is working. I definitely felt like when I just had the one spray, it wasn't enough and everything in the composition started to feel top heavy. So I'm adding some more. I'm gonna add some berries. I'm gonna fill this section out, but don't overthink every decision. You want to have the basics at the top of your mind and then try to lean into your instinct as you go. You need to head to magazines. Someone mentioned in comments recently that old back issues of like florist magazines are a great reference. So there is no shame in using a photograph as inspiration or a springboard for your composition. You can always use that inspiration photo, copy some elements from it, and then once you have your sea legs about you, you can start to add some of your own flourish and flair to that composition. All right, all right, all right. Friends, how are you feeling? I hope this isn't too overwhelming, but if you're in the least bit curious about how this could work out for you in your own art journey, which you consider giving this video a boop, which is a like, I would really appreciate it. All right, another composition tip I have for you is don't get hung up when you feel like maybe you made a mistake. Because sometimes if we live there, if we live in that feeling, that pit in your stomach where you're like, oh, I was liking this, and now I feel like I just totally screwed it up. If you live there, if you put your feet in the sand, what is that colloquialism? Stick your feet in, whatever. You know what I mean. If you stay there, you are going to lose all momentum and you are gonna most likely put this thing to the side and consider it a failure. And that is not what I want for you. Okay, let me tell you a story about that. So my peony rose, honestly, friends, it's a little bit too perfectly centered for me. It's not exactly center, but it's not enough off center for it to feel like I really wanted it. But it's okay because a couple of things, I know I might be able to solve that by choosing some brighter colors in the painting portion of this. I also could add a couple petals to the right or the left to make it feel a little heavier on one side or the other. So I could like totally be crying in my Cheerios right now because I kind of feel like I screwed things up, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to let myself go there. All right, friends, continuing on, clearly I'm obsessed with these eucalyptus sprays and the greenery sprays. And essentially what is happening is I am creating kind of an organic pinwheel effect where all of these sprays and accent flowers are kind of winding around that not off-center enough peony rose central focal point flower. <laughs> 
but they're doing so in a way that's organic. Some of the sprays are longer than others. Some of the sprays are fuller than others. Some are curving up and to the right. Some are curving down and to the left. Some are a little more serpentine. So what is my point with all of this word salad? Or should we call it word flower garden? Anywho, what is my point? My point is, friends, is variety. Variety in your compositions is so important. Variety of shape, variety of size and scale. We talked about those two. Variety of angles, right? But variety of fullness, variety of the size of the details. So some parts of your sketch that are tiny and some that are big and sweeping. I think you get where I'm going. Now the fun part, we're gonna paint friends. Okay, I'm using the half inch dagger. Look at that curved edge. I'm just gonna sketch a few leaves here just for practice curved edge down, use the full width and the full pressure of your brush to fill up a leaf shape that is big enough to handle it. And then use the tip of your brush to color in the rest. And I did say color because it is kind of like we're creating our own coloring page here. I know many of you are new to the dagger brush, so I thought it was time for me to give you a little bit of a close up on how this beauty works and why it's so versatile. You can just cover a lot more space with one brush and one stroke than you can with, say, a round brush. Now, I know some of you really love your round brushes, and that's okay because a really good round brush with a beautiful tip is going to do the job really well. So friends, the idea is to take this kind of technique. It's just one layer where we're picking up a lot of different colors and letting them blend together, starting wet on dry. And then it soon becomes wet on wet because as soon as you lay down a color, your page is wet. And every time you go back to that palette, pick up a little bit of a different color. I want you to use what's in your pans. I want you to use what's in your mixing tray. I don't want you to get obsessed with mixing. See, I went over there and I just added a little bit of water to the mess that's in my mixing tray. And it's giving me the most gorgeous muted greenish bluish thing. And it's perfect for eucalyptus. So listen to me. Part of the joy of this particular style of sketching and then watercoloring is that it's loose and free and very immediate. We're just kind of blasting through this, using our instinct, using the colors that we have, not spending a ton of time obsessing over the perfect color mixes. I don't want to see you, hear you, whatever. You know what I mean? pre-mixing colors. I mean, okay, if it's your jam, you want to pre-mix a bunch of little puddles of your favorite colors, do it, but don't feel like you have to. It can be super fun just to dive in with what you have and with what's already on the palette. I love to mix on my paper, friends, and if you've been around here for more than a hot minute, you probably already know this and you've probably already watched this one, but if not, walk, I mean, no run, don't walk. Man, I'm really bad at those colloquialisms. So remember, the idea here is not to get lost in all the details, all the shading. I am adding a little extra layer right now of color to that rose, peony rose, whatever. I'm diving in, having a blast with this hydrangea, but I'm just getting in the essence. What is the heart and the soul of this flower? For example, the hydrangea. When I think of hydrangea, I think of those Nantucket hydrangeas with all the blues, the purples that are just look like they're almost chameleons changing colors. I wanna just get that vibe down and then move on. And of course, friends, this isn't the only way to approach a sketch that you love, that you've decided you wanna take it beyond sketch to paint. This isn't the only way to do it, but this is a really good start. And what I love about this technique this is how you would paint your base layers if you were going to do a more realistic layer after layer detailed painting. So getting really, really comfortable with this process, I think is going to serve you in so many ways. Thank you. 
All right, friends, how we feeling? Okay, I want you to remember something I said about how this particular style of painting, while it can exist on its own and be incredible, incredible, it can also be the base, the beginning of a more detailed painting. And right now, what I'm doing right now, starting to add second and third layers over top of dry watercolor layers, that's your next step. That's a peek into the next step. Now that's definitely fodder for a new video, but I wanted to give you a little teaser of what that's gonna feel like. Ooh, I feel like we have been on a journey, friends. But if I've left you wanting more, watch this one next. Happy painting.